Welcome to Conceptual Physics at Delaware Tech, Chapter 23, Electric Current. So in the last unit, we talked about electrostatics, about the effects of electric fields on charged particles. And in this unit, we'll be talking about the movement of these charged particles, especially uh, when we're talking about electrons moving through circuits. So we're going to talk about the flow of charge and, and uh, how that relates to electric current. We'll talk about voltage and voltage sources. Voltage is also called electric potential. We'll talk about the concept of electrical resistance. This is resistance to the flow of current. And we'll talk about Ohm's law that relates three different terms together, voltage, current, and resistance. Then we'll talk about the difference between direct current, DC, and alternating current, AC. And we'll discuss the speed and source of electrons in the circuit, and it's not what you think. Then we'll talk about electric power. We've talked about power in other, in other uh, uh, topics where, where it's an amount of energy per time, but it also uh, can be calculated in a different way uh, when we're looking at current and voltage. And then we'll talk about some of the newer devices that make more efficient use of electric current for light. Uh, specifically the compact fluorescent lamps, the CFLs, and the light emitting diodes, the LEDs. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit of, in general about uh, electric circuits, both specific circuits and how they're generally used in homes and some of the safety devices associated with those. So whenever, whenever most introductory courses cover electricity and the flow of electric charge in circuits, we like to use what's called the hydraulic analogy. This is the analogy to how water flows in pipes. And so, so let's think about how water flows. You have water that will naturally flow from a high level to a low level. It's a higher pressure because there's more water on top. So the water will flow into a lower pressure area. We can also think of it in terms of potential energy. Water that's up higher has more potential energy than water that's down lower. And this is gravitational potential energy pulling it down because of its weight and because how high it is above the ground. And when we're talking about electrical uh, currents uh, in electrical conductors, these are materials that allow current to flow like copper wires, for instance. Uh, instead of having different potential energies due to gravity, we have different potential energies due to position relative to other charges. So this is an amount of energy per charge, that's the electric potential, also known as voltage. And this is the driving force that moves electric charges from one place to another in an electric current. But how does the current get back to the beginning? I mean, it flows from a high energy state to a low energy state. It becomes more stable when it goes from high potential energy to low potential energy. And that energy uh, is converted into movement and to the kinetic energy of movement. But how does it get back to the high energy state again. Well, if we're talking about water and we have water that's flowing from a high pressure or high potential energy area to a low pressure or a low potential energy area, it'll flow by itself. But then getting it back to that high area again, we need a pump, we need a water pump. Well, in order to have any sustained flow of charge in a conductor, in a, in a wire, we have to have some kind of pump there as well. So some arrangement has to be made to provide uh, not only the, the difference in potential that will make it go back uh, down to a lower level, to a lower potential level, a lower energy level, but we have to have something to pump it back up to a higher energy level. And in electric, in electric circuits, that is a battery or possibly a generator or some other voltage source, something that can provide electric potential. Remember, electric potential or voltage, same thing, is potential energy per charge. So it's amount of energy per charge of whatever charged particle needs to be moving. And so an, a battery will pump this potential energy for each charge, the potential energy per charge, the voltage, back into the electrons so they can continue the flow around the circuit again. And they might lose energy along the way. Maybe that energy is given to... Uh, to a lamp or to an appliance or maybe just a resistor that just sucks up energy and produces heat. So electric current, we're not talking about voltage now, we're talking about current. Current is the flow of these, these uh, charged particles. 
And this can come in a lot of different varieties. We talked about this in the last unit. In metal wires, this is simply electrons flowing through metal wires. And these electrons come from the metal themselves in the wire. Copper, for example, if you have a copper wire, a very common metal that's used for wiring because, first of all, it's very conductive. It likes to be involved in passing its electrons along in flows uh, with electricity, but it's also uh, very flexible and it can be bent and it can be drawn out in wires. It's what we call ductile, uh, so you can make wires with it. The other metals might be more brittle. Silver is actually a better conductor, but it's a little more brittle than copper and it's also a lot more expensive. So we make most of our wires out of copper. And copper, uh, each copper atom uh, essentially is willing to donate one electron to the sea of electrons that surround the metal in the wire. And this sea of electrons uh, doesn't have to stay with the atom it came from. It can move along. And if it's pulled along by a charge, if we say there's a positive charge on the right side of this diagram, the electrons will flow towards the right, towards the positive charge. And that would be the flow of electric current as the electrons are flowing through the, the lattice structure of the atoms that are left behind. The copper stays there. It doesn't move. It's the electrons that move. The copper is still bound very tightly to other copper atoms, uh, or copper ions in this case, because they lose electrons. And they, they form a very tight lattice structure, a, a kind of a ladder of, of linked coppers. And the electrons flow between them, and flow through them, and flow around them. And that is the current. Uh, so the atomic nuclei, the copper plus ions that are left behind, they just stay there in place. The, the plus charges are not moving. It's only the negative, negative electrons that are flowing here. If you have fluids, however, with charges in them, that's a little bit different situation. You can have both positive and negative particles flowing towards their opposite charge. So if we put a positive charge on the right side of this tube of salt water, it's a, it's a tube of water with sodium chloride, table salt. And when you put table salt in water, it breaks up into ions, sodium plus ions and chlorine minus ions that we call chloride ions. The negative chloride ions will flow to the, towards the positive charge, which I'm gonna say is on the right side. And the sodium ions, which are positively charged, if we put a negative charge on the left side, they would flow to the left side. And you would get kind of a double current adding together. They're both flowing. So it's a net flow of charge because the, the negative charge is flowing one way and the positive charge is flowing the other way, but there is a net flow of charge in that case. All right, so which of these statements is true? Electric current is a flow of electric charge. Electric current is stored in the batteries, both A and B, neither A and B. When we know electric current is defined as the flow of electric charge. Uh, but the, the question is, is the, the electric current stored in the batteries? Where are the electrons coming from? Well, the, the electrons are what make up the current. They're what, flow, what flows in current. And the, the electrons come from the wires. Uh, a little bit comes from the battery, but the bulk of them come from the wires. The, the voltage, the energy is stored in the battery until it's passed to the electrons to make them move around this circuit. But the, the voltage produces the current. It, it keeps them moving around in a, in a completed circuit. You have to have a whole completed circuit for this current to move. The voltage is the driving force that makes the current move. But the battery, um, the battery provides this, this driving force, the voltage, to move electrons that were originally in the wires. You're not, the battery isn't providing the bulk of the electrons to go around in the current. Battery has a little bit of electrons, but the bulk of the electrons are in the wires itself and whatever components are in the circuit. They all have their own electrons that are added to the circuit, but most of that's from the wires themselves. All right, so the rate of, of electric flow, which is defined as the current, it's actually defined as the flow of charged particles per time. Specifically, it's the number of coulombs of charge per second. So. It's, it's the total charge, Q, that's, that Q stands for charge, divided by the time, T, which is usually in seconds, sometimes minutes, but usually in seconds. So it's charge divided by time. And because it's charge divided by time, we see from this formula, 
current, which we, we abbreviate as I. We use I for current, don't use C. That's Coulombs and that's a unit. We're talking about a property here of current, that's I. So I is equal to Q divided by T. Current is equal to charge divided by time. And what that means for you is a certain, uh, a couple different proportionalities. Number one, if you keep time constant, current and charge are proportional to one another. If you increase the current, you will increase the amount of charge that flows for, for a same amount of time. So if I double the current, I'll double how much charge flows through, through the, flows through the wires every second. If I cut the current in half, I will cut how many charges go through in half for every second. Likewise, if we keep the number of charges constant, current is inversely proportional to time. So if we increase time, current goes down. If we decrease time, current goes up, if we have the charges constant. Of course, you can also rearrange this equation of I equals Q divided by T, multiply both sides by T, and you have current I times T, current times time, equals charge. If you want to know how much charge went through after a certain time, you multiply the current by the time. Now, because current is calculated as charge per time, charge divided by time, the units are also in charges divided by time. We use coulombs to measure charges, but remember, coulomb is a lot of charges. It's six quadrillion electron charges. That's a coulomb per second. That's our unit of time. So coulomb per second is our unit of current, and that has been named after after a French scientist named Ampere, and so we call them amperes, or just amps for short. You know, most, most people will just say how many amps is the current, um, but an ampere uh, is our unit of current. Now, do, uh, you have a lot of electrons, because remember, Coulomb is an enormous number of electrons, and even one, uh, one ampere means one Coulomb of electrons, a lot of electrons, per second flowing past a certain point. And that sounds like a gigantic amount, but remember, electrons and atoms are incredibly tiny, so this is actually not that many per second. But if you were actually, and this is the, the flow of all the electrons going through, it's how many are going through past a certain point. But if you looked at any one electron who's buzzing around, bouncing off of things, moving gradually forward in the current, but it's also bouncing all around, if you looked at that individual electron speed, what we call the drift speed of, of electrons in a current, it's actually incredibly slow, much slower than you, what you might imagine. And we'll, we'll mention it later, but, uh, but I'll mention it again now. It is less than one millimeter per second. Now you might've thought, oh, they, don't they move at the speed of light? No, that's the electric field, which we'll talk about later. The electrons themselves are actually incredibly slow through the through the wire, but it's the field we are concerned with when we're talking about carrying energy through a circuit. So charge, that's the current, flows through a circuit. So charge flowing is charge per time flowing. That is, that is what we call current. It flows through a circuit. The electrons are flowing through the wires and they'll flow all the way around. So if you have a single circuit, a single loop of wire with a battery driving driving it with its, its voltage is driving this current going through the circuit. The charge is flowing through the circuit continuously. Even if, they're, if it's being used, uh, if the energy is being transferred to something or, or not, it's always moving through this single, single loop, if it's just a single loop. And the amount of charges going through per second will be the same all the way around that loop. So charge flows through a circuit. That's the word we use. We use that preposition, through a circuit. When we're talking about voltage, we're talking about differences in energy potential on one side of, of, of uh, the circuit to, versus another side of the circuit. And then we refer to voltage as established across a circuit. So there is an energy difference, an energy potential per charge. Remember, that's the potential energy per charge that's what we call uh, electric potential or voltage. So it's, it's looking at changes in the energy state from one side of the circuit to another. That is the voltage. It is across a circuit. 
whereas the charge flows through the circuit. Those are the electrons actually flowing through. So there are two main kinds of circuit, uh, of, excuse me, two main kinds of current. Uh, the, they come in in the AC, which stands for alternating current, and DC, which stands for direct current. And uh, direct current, in direct current, electrons are just flowing around a circuit, and they're always flowing in the same direction from the, uh, since they're negatively charged, they're flowing from the negative terminal of a battery towards the positive. They're attracted to the positive, and they will flow towards the positive until they get to the positive terminal of the battery. And then the battery will essentially add energy to them, and then they'll do another loop around. And this will happen over and over again, always in the same direction, from the negative to the positive, from the negative to the positive. And that's direct current. It's going in one direction directly. But alternating current is very different. Alternating current, the current goes in one direction, and then it, it reverses direction. And then it goes in another direction, it goes forward again, and then it goes back. And it does this cycle of forward and back. And in the United States, the, uh, the current that is coming into your walls, in, uh, into your outlets in your home, is AC current. It's alternating current, which means at, uh, the current that's flowing out uh, of your circuit, uh, out of, excuse me, out of your outlets when you plug things in, is actually uh, in a positive direction, and then it gradually changes to a negative direction, the opposite direction, and then it changes forward, and it changes back. And it does this forward-backward cycle 60 times every second in the United States. In Europe, it's uh, closer to 50 times every second. And it's, so it's 50, uh, 60 cycles. So it's switching directions actually 120 times a second. It goes forward and goes back. That's one cycle forward and back, that's a second cycle. And it does 60 of those cycles or 120 reversals every second. And, uh, and this is not from a battery, this is from a generator or an alternator that literally will, will pump voltage in and then switch the direction of the current and switch the direction of the current and switch the direction of the current. And it's constant switching um, so that the electrons aren't really always moving forward. They're, they're moving forward, then they're moving back. Then they're moving forward, they're moving back. And the electrons really never go anywhere. And you might wonder, well, wait, how can current even happen if that's the case? Well, it's the electrons that are going back and forth. Yes, the current is going back and forth, but the electric field is always going forward. And that's what carries the energy to your appliances. So commercial AC circuits, these are the ones that are in most homes and most businesses in the world, um, sm uh, smaller businesses, not giant factories that might use a different method. Uh, they use AC circuits, alternating current circuits. And we'll talk more about uh, what that looks like and how that's created. Um, but AC, one of the advantages of AC, and there's actually a lot of discussion about the advantages of AC versus DC and vice versa. And in fact, there was a battle in the late 1800s between uh, Edison and his company, which eventually became General Electric, and, and uh, George Westinghouse, Westinghouse, who started his company, Westinghouse. And Westinghouse wanted to use AC, alternating current, and Edison wanted to use direct current. And there was a huge argument about this in the public. In fact, Edison even did a horrible, horrible thing. He used AC current, this is Westinghouse's technology, to electrocute an elephant to prove to the world how dangerous AC current was. And it's not more dangerous than DC. It was, it was a horrible thing to do. But because the World's Fair in, I believe, 1893 in Chicago, they decided to go with Westinghouse's technology to light up the fair. Remember, this is the late 1800s. Nobody had electricity at this point. And because the, the Chicago World's Fair used Westinghouse's AC, the rest of the world saw, saw this at the, at the exposition at the, the World Fair and said, oh, this is amazing. Let's all use AC. And they used AC. And there are some advantages to AC. There are some, some advantages to DC. But one of the big advantages to AC, especially at that time, and this may be a little different now, was AC was able to be uh, 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 stepped up in voltage. In other words, if you create a certain voltage at your source of your voltage, your power plant, your coal burning plant or your fossil fuel burning plant or whatever it is that's producing your energy, um, it, 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 it's much easier to, to transport electric energy when it's in high voltage 
than when it's in low voltage. It's much more efficient. You lose less power along the way in the, in the wires. And that's why we have these high power wires way over our head or buried in the ground that carry very, very high voltages, dangerously high voltages. Uh, and, and so the AC power, there, was, there were technologies that were made it very easy to step up the voltage of the AC power that was created at low voltage to very high voltage so it could be transported across the state or across the country uh, through wires. And so AC took over as being the, the favored technology uh, without losing much power along the way. And then there were what were called step down transformers. If you're transforming it from a low voltage to a high or high voltage to a low, these are called transformers. And then there's step down transformers that would, uh, before it got into your house, it would step it down to a lower voltage, like 120 volts or 240 volts, uh, uh, or even, even additional transformers that would step it down to 12 volts, so that it was a much safer voltage to use in your house for your appliances. Um, but, but transporting it, it's transported at very high voltages, like 2,000 to 14,000 volts, where it would definitely be dangerous to human beings. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why AC got it got to be the much more favored technology. But there's talk today about should we ever switch back to DC because now technology is better for DC as well. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so a conductor, as we mentioned, is any material that has weakly bound electrons that it can kind of give up to become part of this flow of charged particles. And usually that means metals that can give up each me each metal. Uh, atom can give up one electron to be part of this sea of electrons that'll flow around a wire. The, the circle of wire would be called a circuit, and the flow of the, the electrons is called the current. And the driving force that drives this flow around, we refer to as the voltage, because voltage is potential energy. It's actual energy per charge, per the electron charge that we're pushing around this circuit. <clears throat> So the wider the, the conductor, in other words, the thicker the wire, the more flow can, more current can flow through. And this is the same whether we're talking about, about uh, electric wires, um, where we're talking about how many electrons we can pump through, fat wires as opposed to thin wires, but it's also the same for pumping water through big pipes, big conduits rather than little thin pipes. It's the same when we're talking about traffic blowing on a, on a super highway, an eight lane super highway, rather than a, a one lane country road. You can get a lot more flow. It's all the same thing. More things can flow through in a wider channel. So for example, copper wire is a good conductor because the individual copper atoms actually donate about one electron per atom. They release these electrons into the sea that will flow when a voltage source is there to drive the flow. Otherwise, they're just going to stay there. They won't, they won't move. That sea of electrons will just kind of hover around wherever they were at. Um, but, but if you apply a voltage, a battery, for instance, that provides energy to start moving these charges. So that energy uh, is turned into the kinetic energy of the electrons moving. So a four millimeter diameter wire, wire so we're talking about how wide the wire is, four millimeters, that's uh, probably about that big, uh, will allow more current to flow through than a two millimeter diameter wire of the same metal with the same voltage. Um, now, the reason is a, a two, a, a, when you double the width of a wire, remember you're also doubling the height, and the cross-sectional area will go up with the square of the diameter or the square of the radius. Uh, so if you double the diameter, you will double squared or fourfold increase the, the cross-sectional area, the area that, that the electrons have to flow through. It would be the same if you doubled the width of a pipe. You actually make it four times more area for water to flow through. Uh, so it's, it's related to the square of the, of the diameter or the square of the radius. Uh, so you get a lot more current flowing through. You get four times as much current in this case. So the thicker the wire, but, but a thicker wire uh, will and part of this is a thicker wire offers less resistance to the flow of electrons. There are essentially more paths through the, the copper metal for the electrons to get through. The more paths you have, the more space you have, the less resistance there is to the flow, so current will flow through much more easily. 
So let's get back to voltage. So voltage, also called the electric potential, sometimes the potential difference. So it's a difference in, in energy levels because that's what's really important. We usually just call it the electric potential, but it's really a difference of two potentials, one side of the battery and the other side of the battery. And in this diagram down below, the, the circuit is just the, 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 the ring that goes back to the battery. And we, we uh, uh, diagram what are called resistors with a little zigzag line. A resistor is just something that's going to take up some of the voltage. It's going to absorb some of the energy along the way as the current's flowing through it. And that resistor could be just a plain resistor that just absorbs the energy and turns it into heat and doesn't do anything with it. And we use those if we want to regulate uh, current or voltage in a circuit. But, but a resistor can also come in the form of any kind of appliance that's going to use the voltage at, that's flowing across that, that uh, resistor or that appliance, that lamp or that heater or whatever it is you're, you're running the voltage across, running the current through, okay? So uh, you have this resistor and then we have the battery there. Usually you'll see batteries symbolized as uh, two parallel lines and sometimes you'll see a plus sign on one and a minus sign on the, the other um, and that represents a battery source, a voltage source of some sort. But I, we have an actual drawing of a battery here, and it's producing 12 volts of voltage. But by the time it gets through that resistor, it transfers its energy to the resistor, and the current, when the current comes back, it doesn't have that voltage potential anymore. That potential energy is lost, and it has to be recharged by the battery so that it can do another loop around and pass its energy to the resistor again, which will pass it on in the form of heat or if it was a light bulb in the form of both heat and light, if it was an appliance in the form of whatever the appliance does, probably plus a little heat, everything loses heat. So we're looking at the difference uh, in this and the red, the red loops here represent the flow of current, the flow of electrons as they go around this circuit. So it's always gonna be flowing from a high potential, the 12 volts down to after it gives up its, its uh, uh, energy to the resistor, it'll be back down to, to uh, uh, zero volts again and then be recharged by the battery. So the flow of charge will persist until it reaches the same potential as the other end, or, or if there is no other end, it'll just be when everything evens out in, in, in energy. But in order to keep it from never evening out, you have a pumping device. Well, it's a water pump if we're talking about water. It's a battery or some other voltage source when we're talking about current. So the battery is always pumping more energy in so that the, the, uh, the one side of the circuit is always higher potential than the other. It's always a, a higher energy state than the other. And so the electrons always want to move to the, uh, to the other end of the current, uh, the other end of the circuit to get into a lower energy state. So again, with the water analogy, the hydraulic analogy, water will flow from a high reservoir where there's high water pressure and high potential energy to a lower one where it's low pressure and low potential energy. That's just the way water will flow, all right? And we use water pumps in order to keep this flow going because otherwise it would just stop as soon as the water leveled out, the potential energy difference would be even and the whole thing would stop. And the same thing would happen with a current if you, if you let if you put in a little voltage and then pulled the voltage source away, the electrons would just stop moving. There's nothing driving them anymore. Uh, they all have that same potential at that point. But if you have a pump that's continuously pumping in energy on one side of the circuit or pumping water up high on one side of this, this water flow, um, you'll be able to uh, get the flow um, uh, that, that would otherwise might not happen. So no flow of charge happens when the potential energy is different, is zero, uh, there, excuse me, when the potential difference is zero, when, when the same voltage on either side, there's, there's no flow across that at that point. Um, so you have, to, you have to have a pump. Your pump is the battery or some kind of voltage source. So the electric potential difference, the voltage, is created by a battery or a generator or something else. Uh, that will keep that steady flow of charge going. It's the, it's the energy source that, that pumps in, just like a pump is the energy source when you have a cycle of water going around. The work is done pulling the negative charges from the positive ones inside the battery. So the battery has some chemistry going on 
there are chemical reactions in the battery. So the battery eventually will be used up. That's why batteries die. There's certain chemistry going on. There are a certain amount of chemicals in there, and they're slowly reacting over time. And as you drain that energy, that energy goes into the circuit and comes around, and then the electrons are recharged. They go around. But eventually, the chemistry that's happening inside the battery uh, is, is all completely reacted, and then the battery dies, and it can't provide any more voltage. But the job of the battery is essentially do these chemical reactions where you're separating electrons from the rest of molecules, and, and in doing so, you're creating a, an energy that can be passed into the circuit. <clears throat> so the prime sources of the voltage to drive the current the, 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 uh, in an electric circuit are the batteries or the generator. They are the source of the current. I'm sorry. They are the source of the voltage, not the current. The current are the flow of electrons, which come from the wires. All right. Now, uh, in addition, you might have what's called electromagnetic induction. And we have a whole unit after the, uh, uh, after the magnetic um, section, which is the next unit. So two units later, uh, two chapters later in your textbook is on this. But we don't do this chapter in the textbook. We don't cover electromagnetic induction. We briefly mention it in the, in the chapter on magnetism, but we don't cover it in detail. But essentially what this is, is it uses a magnetic field in order to generate current. And what you're going to find out when, we, when you study magnetism is magnetic fields can create current and current can create magnetic fields. And when you're looking at light, um, light is actually composed of both a magnetic wave and a electric wave and one creates the other and the other creates the first and they reinforce each other and that's what that's what light of all all types is anything anything in the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to visible light to gamma rays uh, does this all right so so electromagnetic induction uses these magnetic fields to create electric fields and this electric field allows voltage to be produced to move electrons around in a circuit. So that's that's how a generator would work to do this, as opposed to a battery that has the chemistry inside. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that here, though. All right. So in chemical batteries, um, there, there are chemical reactions going on. And so electrons are being moved from one chemical to another in the process. And, and as a result, a lot of energy is released. And that energy can be passed on to the electrons that are moving in the circuit. And uh, there are a lot of different chemistries that are used. Uh, two classic ones are, are reactions of zinc with some magnes uh, manganese oxide compounds. Uh, and another, uh, another classic reaction, especially in car batteries, involves two different compounds of lead that are, that are reacting in the presence of acid uh, also to form energy. But there are also things called lithium batteries that do chemistry with lithium. And there are many, many types of batteries. We're not going to go into that chemistry. That's a chemistry course topic. And it's actually in one of the more advanced chemistry courses, Chem 151, if you ever want to study that. Um, but just know that you're creating energy from these chemical reactions, typically from lead or zinc or other things. So this energy that was stored in the chemical bonds is released. And then that released energy is converted into electric potential energy, PE, the potential energy. And when you divide potential energy by each of the charges that gets that energy, that's what voltage is. So voltage is this energy that's released per charged particle, per, per coulomb of electrons. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of resistance and how it's involved in, in uh, circuits. So a circuit has current flowing through them. We abbreviate current with the letter I. We abbreviate voltage with the letter V. And we use units of volts for, for voltage. We use amps or amperes for current. And we have electric resistance. This is the resistance to the current, to the flow of the electrons flowing around, something that makes it harder for those electrons to flow through. They'll still flow through, but it makes it more uh, energetically unfavorable. And that's called electrical resistance or resistance. It's abbreviated with a capital R. And the units are named after uh, a German scientist, Georg Ohm. Uh, so the units are called ohms. And we abbreviate ohms with the Greek letter, the capital Greek letter omega. And that's what that, that weird squiggle is. It looks like an upside down U with two pieces hanging off of it. Uh, you may have seen in, in religious ceremonies, alpha to the omega. 
Omega is the last letter of the alphabet. Uh, 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 alpha is the, is the first letter of the alphabet. So when somebody says from the alpha to the omega, they mean everything, the whole alphabet or the whole universe. Okay, so omega is the symbol for, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, omega is the, sim, is the letter we use for, for ohms, and ohms is the unit we use for resistance. Resistance is the property, abbreviated R. Ohms is the unit, abbreviated o omega. Hope I didn't confuse you there. All right, so resistors, these are, these are uh, elements in a circuit that regulate the current. Uh, inside any kind of electrical device that has current flowing through it. And they do that by resisting current. And they come in a lot of different varieties. You have some resistors that, that um, always have the same resistance, the same number of ohms. You have others that will change when you increase their or decrease the temperature. These are the thermistors. Uh, we have photoresistors that are sensitive to light. They'll turn on or turn off and become resistors when, when light hits them or when light doesn't hit them. You have trimmer resistors that can actually be varied. You can There's actually a little dial in there, and you can turn it and make them more or less resistant. Uh, and the variable resistors, potentiometer on the left here, also a variable one that you can change the resistance of. So, but these are resistors that are just meant to do one thing, well, to actually cause resistance of the current. Okay, they, they the, the energy is diverted into just heat and or heat or maybe into light or something else. But uh, lamps, these are actual devices that have things that will essentially use up the voltage energy. And that's why they're called loads. So anything in a circuit that's going to be sucking up that voltage, that energy, that potential energy from the electrons going around, we call it a load. And that's because they all act as resistors. Lamps act as resistors. They're absorbing some of the energy as the current's flowing through them. They don't stop the current flowing through, but they do take some of that voltage energy and use it to light the lamp or turn on the heater or turn on the fan or whatever it is that you're using uh, the electricity for. Uh, but they'll act as resistors because they're pulling some of that voltage away. And uh, the filament of a lamp, the, the part that actually lights up, the little wire in the lamp that lights up, it's called the filament. And so when, when electrons are flowing through there, they smack into the metal that the filament's made of. Usually it's tungsten nowadays uh, and tungsten metal. And, and the current uh, bangs around and it releases it as heat, mostly heat, but some of it is light. And that's why lamps are lamps. Uh, these are the classic incandescent light, light bulbs that you've seen in everyday homes. Uh, so th those act as resistors as well as actually producing light. All right, so current flows through the resistor or the, or the appliance or the lamp or whatever it is, current flows through it. It's still the same amount of current going through. Whatever started going through will come out. That many, that many amps of current, that many coulombs per second of electrons flowing through, that's not changed. But it's the voltage is the driving force. So once it dri it's driving it through the device and then the voltage uh, is is essentially used up some of it or all of it is used up on the other side of that by the other side so it's voltage driving it across that resistor or across that lamp or across that fan or whatever device you're powering up so the resistance when we when we write it in circuits we use a little squiggly a little zigzag line that's that's a resistor um, and it could be any kind of resistor. Usually you use that if you're talking about a, a true resistor, but we're gonna use that if it's a lamp or a resistor or anything that's gonna use up some of that voltage, we'll write that symbol down. All right, so what affects electrical resistance? What changes it? What makes it go up? What makes it go down? Well, one thing we've already talked about is how wide the wires are. Wires actually will resist electricity. Now, when we do calculations here, we're gonna assume the wires don't uh, absorb that much voltage along the way and that, that uh, the energy goes through unimpeded and you don't lose any voltage in the wire part, not the, the resistor you'll lose it, the lamp you'll lose it, the whatever, whatever device you'll lose it. But, uh, but the fact is real, real resistance happens in the wire. You try to get wires that are good that don't have much resistance, but they all have some. And the, the wider the wire is, the more cross-sectional area on that wire, the less resistance. The, you know, if you double the width, the width of the wire, uh, you will make it easier for the electrons to flow through, just like 
the wider a pipe, you'll have less resistance for water to flow through. It's the same thing. The wider the highway, you'll have less resistance for traffic to flow through. So resistance is also proportional to the length. You make it longer, it's going through more wire. It, you double the length, you're gonna get double the resistance. Uh, and this could be just plain wire, or it could be an actual long resistor in there that's meant to suck up energy along the way. You double that length, there's just more places for the electrons to lose their energy and smack against things and bump into each other along the way to give up their energy in the form of heat. So you double the length, you'll double the resistance. The first one, it's, it's inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area, which means you double the area, you'll, you'll cut the resistance in half. But another way to say that is you double the diameter, and we said this before, the diameter squared is proportional to the area, not the diameter by itself. So if you double the diameter, you are actually increasing the area fourfold, squared term, and therefore you're making the resistance go down fourfold. So what it says here is inversely proportional to the area which means it's inversely proportional to the square of the diameter or the square of the radius. And it's also directly proportional to the length of the wire. That's the other dimension. So the longer the wire, the harder it is, the more energy has to go, uh, it takes more energy to get that of those electrons through there. So you double the resistance. So it's always harder to pump water through longer pipes than shorter pipes, all right? Resistance is also dependent on the material. You start using an insulators instead of conductors, insulators like wood or plastic or glass or rubber. They don't like letting electrons flow at all. That's what, a that's what an insulator is. Whereas conductors are happy to let their electrons free so that they can conduct through. Insulators don't like to share electrons and when they do get extra electrons, they just stay where they're at, they don't flow. Another factor that affects resistance is temperature. When you heat things up, remember the electrons are flowing through this lattice of say copper atoms. So you got the copper wire and the copper atoms are in there. Well, copper atoms are always vibrating because uh, we're not at absolute zero. There's always a little temperature and a little heat in everything. So the atoms are just vibrating. But if you heat them up, the copper atoms start vibrating even more. They're st they stay in place, but they're vibrating. And that makes it harder for the electrons to get through. So you increase the temperature and the electrons are banging around faster and the, and the copper atoms that they were part of are vibrating more and it just makes it harder for the electrons to pass through this disorganized uh, lattice structure that, they, that the coppers are making uh, as because of all these extra vibrations from the increased heat. So you get more resistance, you get more, uh, more of the electrons smacking into things and giving up their energy in the form of heat instead of continuing on to pass their energy in the form of voltage to something. So in the filament of a light bulb, it resists current. We already talked about that. And that's because the electrons inside the filament, the tungsten filament, are not only colliding with each other, but they're colliding with the tungsten itself and banging around and releasing huge amounts of heat. And a little bit of that energy instead of being heat is light. So these incandescent light bulbs uh, the light bulbs that produce your typical white light light bulb that you screw into a into a lamp. Uh, the vast majority of the energy, 90 to 95 percent of the energy, is actually coming out in heat. That's why you can't touch a, a lit light bulb. It's so damn, so hot. Um, but only a small fraction is light, and that's actually a problem. That's why people have developed more energy efficient light bulbs that we'll talk about later. The CFLs and the and the uh, uh, LED uh, diode uh, light bulbs. Uh, these. These are much more efficient where, where you might get as much as 30% of the energy being used to produce light. Uh, so they work, they work uh, to save a lot of energy in the process here. So when you have this extra energy of the vibrating, it just interferes with the pass of the electrons going through and you get increased resistance. All right, semiconductors, we talked about these before. Uh, they're materials that are somewhere between conductors and insulators. They're somewhere between being able to share their electrons and move them along in current and not being able to share electrons at all. And uh, typically, metalloids, also called the semi-metals, these are the ones on the periodic table on the, on the right side between the non-metals on the far right upper corner of the periodic table and the bulk of the rest of the periodic table, uh, 
uh, things like silicon and germanium and arsenic and boron. These are somewhere in the middle and uh, usually impurities are purposely added to them to make them increase in their conductivity. So silicon is the most common one, germanium is occasionally used, and then those are doped with impurities in order to uh, either add extra electrons or take away extra electrons, so electrons will flow within these, these sort of half metal, half non-metal um, substances. And superconductors, we talked about these as well. Uh, these are materials that uh, have been chilled down to incredibly cold temperatures, and it was found by, by Heinke Onis, a, a Dutch scientist in 1911, so this is over 100 years ago, he chilled down, uh, it was actually solid mercury. He was using mercury metal uh, as a conductor, but he was, he was working with it so cold uh, with liquid helium to chill it down to only four degrees above absolute zero, so insanely cold. But he found that once he, he cooled the mercury down past a certain point, all of a sudden the resistance, the resistance was dropping and dropping, and then all of a sudden it just plunged to zero at a certain temperature, and there was no resistance. Now, what does that mean? It means materials with this, with this zero electrical resistance, if you use the voltage and you gave it current, and then you remove the voltage source, and you just let the current stay in, normally that would just stop almost immediately, and the current would stop flowing without that constant pumping in of energy from the, vo from the voltage source, like a battery or a generator. But it turns out when you do this with, with materials that are now superconducting, you add a little voltage to get the current going, you can just watch it go for years. And people have actually experimentally watched this happen for 27 years with no measurable loss of energy, no measurable loss of current during that 27 years. They've calculated that uh, theoretically it means they'll have no loss for over 100,000 years. And then some people have calculated that these materials should, in theory, hold their current going around the circuit for longer than the age of the universe. And I mentioned this last time, but I really want you to understand how amazing superconducting materials are. But the problem is you have to cool a lot of substances down to crazy, crazy cold temperatures. So people have been working on be uh, be uh, newer and newer substances that work at higher and higher temperatures in order to get this flow of charge without any loss of heat, without any loss of energy in the form of heat as, it's, as the current's flowing around. So people are working on what are called su uh, the high temperature superconductors. This basically means anything where you don't have to cool it lower than 100 Kelvin, 100 degrees Kelvin. That's still incredibly cold. But every year somebody comes up with something that will work at a slightly higher temperature. And right now they've gotten to a temperature that's about I want to say somewhere between zero and 15 degrees Kelvin. That's, that's the temperature of a cold to a cool day outside. Uh, but the thing is, those superconductors only work when they're under insanely high pressures, like millions, time, millions of times the atmospheric pressure when you go outside. Um, so we don't have normal materials to do that. But some normal materials have been made with certain ceramics that have been made, very special ceramics that have uh, unusual combinations of metals and non-metals in them, and they'll work uh, as high as 100 degrees Kelvin, maybe even 150 degrees Kelvin, and every year somebody gets something better each year, um, but, but there are some more and more unusual compounds and mixtures, sometimes at high pressure, sometimes not, and the goal is eventually to get a substance that will work at normal pressure and at normal temperature with no resistance and that is the holy grail of finding superconductors that researchers in this field are looking for because then you just pump in some energy and you walk away and the current flows forever so i mentioned georg ohm this is the person we named the unit for resistance after the ohm abbreviated with the omega symbol ohm uh came up with some findings of proportionality that relate voltage current and resistance in conductors. Now I say this in conductors because while we call this Ohm's law, technically it's not really a law because it doesn't work all the time. In conductors and in normal circuits it works beautifully and you're going to use it in this class and assume it always works, but I'm going to tell you it doesn't work in superconductors, it doesn't work in special types of electronic equipment called diodes and certain transistors, um, uh, but, but in regular circuits with regular conducting wire it works great. And here, here's what he found. 
he found that the, cir the current in a circuit is directly proportional to the, the potential difference. That is the voltage in that circuit. So current is directly proportional to voltage. I is directly proportional to V. He also found that current is inversely proportional to, to resistance. If you increase the resistance, the current will go down. If you decrease the resistance, the current will go up. Whereas the top relationship says, if you increase the voltage, you'll increase the current. In other words, you increase the driving force, the voltage, the energy per charge that's pushing the current, you'll get more current, more electrons flowing through. That makes perfect sense. You increase the resistance, you're making it harder for current to flow through. That's the definition of resistance. So of course the current will go down. The words actually tell you the, the relationship without actually looking at these. But if you combine this I is proportional to V and I is proportional to one over R and you meld them together, you get I is proportional to V over R, but it actually turns out if you use the right units, I is directly equal to V over R. And this is what people usually write as Ohm's law, either V equals IR or I equals V over R, or you could solve for R and R would be V over I, okay? Uh, so any one of these versions is considered the mathematical form of Ohm's law. But remember, these show you proportionality. Uh, if you look at this first equation, a current I is proportional to V, voltage. Current I is inversely proportional to the resistance. And if you look at the second formula, you see in addition that if you keep the resistance uh, constant, voltage is proportional to current. V is proportional to I. That's the same thing we said. But voltage is also proportional to resistance if you keep the current the same. So if you're keeping one of the three the same, you can tell what the other two are doing by looking at one of these two equations. Get used to looking at the proportionality Z's that will come up over and over again. And it's the easier way to analyze things when somebody tells you this is doubled, this has stayed the same, this is tripled, this has been cut in half, what happens to the other things. All right, so for example, uh, if we keep the, the resistance constant, but we double the voltage, so 2V two, two instead of 1V, the current will be doubled. So if we look at this, uh, if we look at either one of the top two equations, we can see voltage and current are directly proportional. You double one, you're gonna double the other if you keep resistance constant. That's all this is saying. Mathematically, you can just shove it into the formula and say 2V divided by 1R, we're not changing R, is two times V over R. Well, V over R is the original current. So we have two times the original current. That's another way to analyze this. Likewise, if you double the resistance and you double the voltage, so if we use this equation I equals V over R, and we're doubling V and we're doubling R, well, two divided by two just cancels, and we're just left with the original V over R current. So we don't affect the current at all. In terms of proportionality, the way to think about this is I double the resistance. Oh, the current goes down by, by twofold but I'm also doubling the voltage. Oh, the current goes up by twofold. Well, if I go down by twofold and I go up by twofold, that's no change at all. If I cut something in half and then I double it, I'm back to the original amount. That's another way to think about it, and that might be an easier way to think about it in this case. So resistors, to remind you, are circuit elements that regulate current inside electrical devices, and they regulate current by essentially taking some of that voltage energy and converting it into heat that's just kind of either thrown away or converted into some energy for an appliance. So let's look at this question on Ohm's law. When you double the voltage in a simple electric circuit with constant resistance, so we're not changing R, we're doubling V, you double the A current resistance, both A and B, neither A and B. Well, it tells you right there resistance is constant. If you keep the circuit the same, you're gonna have the same resistance. So you're doubling the voltage. Voltage is proportional to uh, the current. So the current will also double. Uh, you're obviously not touching the resistance in this case. Uh, so there's your direct proportionality. If you double the voltage, the, the current will, will double. If you double the current, the voltage will double. Uh, and that's because current is voltage over resistance. So that's where you get your proportionality. All right. So let's talk a little bit about electric shock. Now, 
uh, damaging effects from shock uh, actually result from the current passing through your body, not the voltage passing across your body. This is something that, that uh, people confuse, and I used to confuse this all the time. Uh, it's how many electrons are flowing through your body, not that energy difference in the electrons, not the voltage. It's the current that kills people. It's not the voltage that kills people. And when you have a bird sitting on a power line, the reason why they don't die on these high power lines is because there is no current. There is no circuit. There, there's, the circuit isn't closed. The, the, the electricity could go into the bird, but there's nowhere to go back down to the ground or complete the circuit in a loop. So the birds are harmed, uh, are, uh, the, it's harmless to the birds as long as they're just sitting up top. If they're sitting on, on a wire and they touch something else, that's a whole nother story, but on a wire, they're fine. So your resistance, your, as a human being, your resistance can vary tremendously from 100 ohms, which is moderately low, to, to 500,000 ohms, which is extremely high. And when do you have low resistance, 100 ohms? Well, when your body is soaked in salt water. You just came out of the ocean. You're covered in water that has nice ions, sodium and chloride ions, and a bunch of other ions from the ocean. You are a wonderful conductor of electricity, and you are not resisting electricity very much. So, so your resistance is extremely low. Whereas when your skin is totally dry, there's no water on it, you're not sweating, nothing's happening to you. You don't have any open wounds. There's no moisture there. There's nothing to flow. Your resistance is extremely high. It's very hard to make electricity flow through you. So if you're given a certain voltage, it could be just the voltage out of, out of your outlet uh, out of, that you would plug into, 120 volts. That could, 120 volts divided by uh, when you have dry skin, which is 500,000 ohms, that'll give you a very, very tiny current, a very, very tiny eye. Dividing 120 by 500,000 will give you a very small current, a very small number. But if you divide 120 by 100 ohms, that'll be 1.2 amps. And that's a significant amount of electron flow around your body and through your body. And that will hurt you quite a bit. So you have to be extremely careful depending on what is going on with the outside of your body and your total resistance as a result. So being wet with either sweat or water, open sores, can lower your resistance dramatically and therefore increase the effect of a low voltage to become a high current. We talked a little bit about direct current and alternating current before, but let's look at what that means in terms of the actual current. For a direct current, you have a steady current. It's always going from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, the electrons are always flowing in one direction from negative to positive. They're attracted by positive because they are negatively charged. And batteries are great sources of this and they'll just keep flowing. So if you monitor the current over time, it's just a steady flow until the battery dies and then it'll die out. Okay, so it's just a constant, we'll call it a positive flow in this case. But alternating current shown in the bottom here, it's at first, it's nothing, then it becomes a positive flow. So it's going from, we'll call it terminal one to terminal two. And then, and then all of a sudden, it's gradually changed so that the current is now going from terminal two to terminal one. And then it's switched back and forth. So the direction of the current, the electrons are going this way, then they slow down, and then they go this way, and then they slow down, and they go this way. And it's just constantly going back and forth. And it does one of these cycles for, forward and back. 60 times in a second. That's a lot of changes. That's 120 changes in direction every second because the current is going from positive to negative, positive to negative, constantly changing. It's alternating uh, the direction of the current. And uh, batteries can't do that. Batteries just let out a steady current in one direction, always from their negative terminal to their positive terminal. And it's always flowing that way. So how do you do it? Well, you do it with with devices called generators or alternators that will actually change the, the direction of the current constantly. So the electrons will actually move forward, then they'll move backwards, they'll move forward and then backward. So there's no net flow of the electrons over time. Even if you did have net flow, it's very, very slow. But if you now have slow forward and then slow backwards and slow forward, the electrons aren't really gonna go anywhere. The electrons that were here after an hour still are pretty close to here. They're not really moving all that much in the process. Okay, 
Uh, so commercial electricity in North America, that is US, Canada, and, and Mexico, um, uh, I don't know as much about Central America, but it's probably all similar, similar uh, uh, power situations. Every country varies a little bit as far as their voltage and as far as the number of cycles per second. And you can look at maps of the world. It's extraordinarily complex about what every country is doing. Uh, but in general, you have North America that's using uh, current that's about 120 volts. It actually varies between 110 and 125. Uh, and uh, a, a frequency of changing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Each back and forth is one cycle of 60 cycles per second, 60 hertz. So that's 120 changes every second. And that's the, the form of alternating current that's typically used in the U.S. and surrounding countries. <clears throat> um, but the power, power transmission, so this is carrying power from one location to another, say from the power plant to a neighborhood. Uh, power transmission is always more efficient if you use high voltage. And again, this is why the high, the high wires uh, crossing across your town are extremely high voltage in the thousands of volts because it's much more efficient. You lose less heat along the way, you lose less energy along the way so that most of that energy gets delivered to wherever it's going. So uh, it's because, uh, because of that, you wanna, you wanna uh, uh, keep your power as low as you can and power you'll find is equal to, we'll, we'll get into this power is equal to current times voltage so if you've got high voltage, you, you can use low current in that case. So uh, Europe and a lot of other countries, a lot of other countries outside of the continent of Europe uh, tend to use a uh, higher voltage, uh, what they'll call 240. It's actually anywhere from 220 to 250. Uh, and they use a different cycling, uh, 50 hertz. Uh, that, the 50 hertz decision is in part due to the metric system where they like everything to be uh, multiples of 100 or halves of 100. So they use 50 hertz. I believe it was the Siemens Corporation in Germany that built a lot of that early infrastructure there. Um, and they use higher voltage. And there, there are arguments as to which one's better, which one's worse. But the fact is, even in the US, uh, we use 120 volts. But um, by using two, uh, two wires with 120 volts, uh, and I'm not going to get into the details, but if you uh, have these two delivering 120 volts in the right way, slightly different from one another, you can actually create 240 volts. So a lot of the energy that comes into the house is either uh, in, the, in the form of 120 volts uh, voltage or 240 volts for the bigger appliances in your home. Uh, and that's what, how we're able to do it. We're able to do it by manipulating the 120. But it's directly delivered to homes as two, roughly 240 in, in Europe and the bulk of the, of the rest of the world. Um, US stayed with 120 because we had the earliest systems produced in the late 1800s and nobody wanted to change their appliances and their infrastructure. So we just kept with that forever. And there are arguments as to which one's better, which one's worse, um, and, but it's probably never gonna change. All right, so how do we convert AC to DC? Because the fact is the vast majority of the appliances you have in your house, especially your computers, only work with DC power. They have to have a direct current, a continuous current in one direction for them to work. If you plug AC directly into your computer, your computer would be destroyed. And that's why uh, if you ever look on the power cords on your computer, you see a little box in the middle of your power cord. That is a converter that will convert the AC power coming out of your outlet to a flat DC amount of current that's constant that will go into the battery of your computer to power up the battery and therefore power up your computer. Uh, so uh, you have to have some kind of converter. And this, this converter uses a couple different devices, uh, one device called a, a diode, another device called a capacitor that we talked about before. Uh, a diode uh, can be used to, uh, it's kind of, you can think of it as a one-way valve. And it, it can, the different diodes can be used in different ways. But if you have this alternating current that's changing from one direction to the other, one direction to the other, you can use one diode that will uh, only accept the positive current, the only the current in one direction. So you'll end up with current coming and then stopping and then nothing, and then current coming and stopping, coming up and stopping, and you get these humps. And I'll show you that in the next slide here. So if you have incoming, incoming AC in figure A, 
you have the diode that essentially only lets the top half of that current through. It doesn't let negative, the negative direction current through. And then you might have another diode that will take the other direction and flip it. So it, be, so it adds to it in what you see in D. And in the meantime, so you have this pulsing that's separated, and then you add another diode that'll, that'll take the negative current and turn it into positive current. Now you have a bunch of humps. And then on top of that, you use a capacitor that will be slowly charged by your current. It'll slowly build up charge on two plates and then slowly release the charge. So that instead of getting a hump and a hump and a hump and a hump, you get a flatter hump and then a, a, uh, a less prominent dip and then a flatter hump and a less prominent dip. And that's what the orange line is, that smoother curve. And ultimately these can be smoothed so they're almost dead flat looking exactly like a DC current. You use a pair of diodes, you use a capacitor, uh, and, and so one of the diodes only takes the top, inner, the top current, the other one flips the bottom one, and then the capacitor kind of smooths everything out. Uh, and that's how you convert AC to DC. All right, so let's talk about circuits themselves. Uh, when we flip a switch on a wall, on a, we're actually completing the circuit. Electric field is what flows through the circuit. It's what makes the current happen. And that electric field, the energy for that field is provided by the voltage, by the battery or the generator, or whatever is our voltage source. And that, so the second we flip the light switch, we've had a circuit that has a hole in it, that has a break in it. Flipping the light switch essentially closes that. So now it's a complete circuit that allows electrons to flow and the voltage can now be used to push electrons around the circuit. Well, what's happening in, this, in the circuit? The electrons aren't just moving directly forward. And this is kind of a weird diagram. This is from your textbook. Uh, think of the solid green lines as the random motion of electrons before the current has actually been turned on, before the voltage has been added to make current happen. So you get these electrons just bouncing around almost randomly. They might be hitting each other. They might be hitting the copper metal or whatever metal they're part of in the, and that wire. And then the field, the electric field, which is produced because of the energy from the voltage, the field is what moves everything along. And then you get what looks like this dotted pattern. Now you'll notice the randomness is still there, but now you move the whole randomness, so it's random here, and now it's still random, but it's kind of gradually moving forward in its crazy randomness. And that's what these two uh, uh, solid and dotted lines are supposed to represent. So once the current is established, it's established as the elect because of the electric field moving everything through the wires. Now here's the weird thing. The field, the energy that's going through the wires, this goes through the wires almost instantly. It's, it's nearly the speed of light, about 90% of the speed of light. That's 270,000 kilometers per second. That's, that's more than the distance from the Earth to the moon in one second, okay? So that, that's how fast the field goes through the wires. But the electrons, because they're doing all this crazy stuff, they take forever to actually move. They're moving less than one millimeter in a second. Whereas the field is moving 270,000 kilometers in a second. It is crazy to think about. The electrons are barely moving, but there are so many electrons that are moving, so that's why you have current that's significant. There's so many electrons that are moving slowly, but a lot of them are passing every point in time. If you say how many are going through this every second, it's a lot. That would be your amperage, your current, okay? But each one electron is taking forever to move. It's moving less than a millimeter in a second. So it takes a long time to travel. But the, the field, the second you hit the switch, the field goes around the entire circuit and will affect the movement of all the electrons almost simultaneously. So they'll all be moving. The light will turn on instantly because the electrons that are already in the light bulb are already moving and that's going to produce light instantly. But the electrons in the rest of the wire will take a long time to get through uh, when you have this direct current. So it's the field is instant. The electrons are slow, but there are a lot of electrons, so that's why you have 
current going past any one point in the wire at any one time. So it's a field that travels through nearly the speed of light, blink of an eye, and that's why you get the light turn on so fast, even though the electrons are taking forever to get to there. It's the electrons that are already there that are doing that job. So a circuit, if, if, if the voltage source is DC, like a battery, the electric field lines are in one direction. They're always, the, the field lines are, are, are uh, going from one terminal to the other, and you get these field lines that spread out from the two terminals, and they get weaker as they go further apart. The inverse square rule, they're stronger when they're closer to the terminals. And if you have a wire connecting them, the field lines, some of those field lines will be in the wire. They will actually match inside the direction of the wire, parallel to the direction of the wire. And so the electrons that happen to be in the wire that are in the field, this is this force field of the electric force that's flowing all around the terminals, that is what will drive the electrons. But the field will be generated instantly, almost, almost the speed of light, and then the electrons will start moving slowly, but enough of them flow through to create current that can actually be your current in your circuit. It's a weird concept to think about. So before they gain appreciable speed, the, the electrons are always bumping into things. They're bumping into the, into the metal that's anchored there in place. The, the copper is not moving anywhere. Those ions are not moving. The electrons are moving. So initially there's a resistance to get moving and they, they find their spaces between this lattice of copper. Uh, but you, you get some of this energy lost because they're banging into themselves and banging into the, the, the copper atoms, the ions of copper and the atoms of copper, and that is released in part as heat resistance, and that's where the resistance comes from. All right, so some misconceptions about electric current. Uh, here's the first one. Electri uh, current is propagated through the conducting wires by electrons bumping into one another. In other words, people think that the electrons are moving because they're, they repel each other. One negative charge repels another, and it's it's pushing and it's pushing this and it's pushing this and they're banging into each other and, and moving. And they think that's what's driving the current. Well, it turns out this isn't true. That happens, but that's not what's driving the current. The electrons are actually free to move. They're accelerated not by the repulsion of one electron to another electron to another electron, but by the electric field, the force lines of electricity that are moving them from, from the, the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And that it's the force lines, the electric field is what's moving them. The electrons do in fact bump into each other and they'll bump into the atoms. But this actually has the opposite effect. It slows them down. It's resistance to the current. You don't want the electrons banging into each other. You don't want them banging into the copper metal. You certainly don't want them banging and repelling against each other. It slows down their flow in that direction. So that's what resistance is. So all electrons along the entire path, they're not waiting for the electrons behind them to get close so they move forward. That's not what happens. They all move at the exact same moment, or almost the exact same moment, the speed of light, you know, whatever the speed of light is for that, uh, getting uh, how much time it takes, that's how much time for all the electrons to feel the force, and all of them move in the, in the circuit simultaneously or near simultaneously. Another misconception, electrical outlets in the walls are the homes, uh, are, uh, of the homes are the sources of electrons. In other words, when you plug something in, the electrons in your, in your circuit are coming from the wall, coming from the, from the outlets. No, they're, we already know they're actually coming from the wires. There might be some in the walls, but the bulk of them are in the wires and in the appliances where the, where the wires are inside flowing through. The wires are what provide the electrons that flow in the circuit. Uh, the outlets are AC, so the electrons aren't really actually going anywhere anyway. The AC means current is alternating direction. It's alternating, it's going this way, it's going this way. So any electrons anywhere in the circuit stay where they're at. So the electrons in the, cir in the outlet pretty much stay in the outlet, and the electrons in the wires stay in the wire, and the electrons in the filament of your lamp stay in the filament of your lamp. Um, they're just zigzagging back and forth. There's a lot of random motion in the middle, but they're, they're ultimately moving just back and forth, so they're not really traveling anywhere um, in AC current. Actually, once you get into the appliance, the appliances use DC, it's converted. So there, there is traveling, but most of that is from whatever electrons 
happen to be nearby. It's the, the bulk of them are not coming from your outlet at all. So when you plug a lamp into an outlet, the energy flows from the out, the energy flows from the outlet to the lamp through the wires, not the electrons. It's the energy, your energy source is some voltage source somewhere else that comes through high power wires, comes into your house, and then comes into your outlet, and you plug in, and that's where your energy is coming from, not the electrons. The electrons were already there in whatever wiring you're using. The energy is, is what creates the electric field, which the second you turn on the circuit, whenever you close the circuit by flicking a switch, the circuit is closed, you get the loop now, the, electricity, the electric field is, is created within the blink of an eye, the speed of light, and that will create the motion of electrons, but uh, if it's AC, they're just gonna go back and forth. If it's DC, they're moving very slowly with a lot of random motion in the middle. So electrical utility companies, they sell energy. They're not selling you the electrons and that's, that's part of the wiring. Uh, they're selling you the voltage, which is energy per charge that's flowing. All right, so electric power, I mentioned this before, We've already talked about power. Power is, is the rate of energy per time. So it's how much energy is converted into some other form or used to do work, work uh, either do work or produce heat or produce light or do some, some uh, something that you desire the, the energy to do. And it's how much energy per time. So it's literally joules of energy per second of time or energy divided by time. And we've done that before. But in electricity, it is also equal to the current I times the voltage V. Very simple equation. Power equals current times voltage. So if you know the current in amps and you know the voltage in volts, multiply the two and that's how many watts of power you get. Because when you multiply amps times volts, that is how you get watts. Watts are also joules of energy divided by seconds. We've already done that. That's a watt named after James Watt. Um, uh, but it works out that the units of ampere times volt will also give you the same watt unit. So either way, either equation, as long as you use these units, you'll end up with watts in the end for power. And so if you have this equation P equals IV, let's look at that one first. That means the power is proportional to current if the voltage is constant. It's also proportional to voltage if the current is constant. So uh, so P equals I, P is proportional to I, P is proportional to V if the other one is constant. But if you rearrange this equation in the bottom here, so here's a situation where we have a 100 watt lamp and we're told it's drawing, that's how we refer to current, it's drawing 0.83 amperes or amps of current for a 120 volt outlet. Our outlets are, are 120 volts in the United States uh, and our light bulb will say how many watts of power it needs. So it'll say a 100 watt light bulb. It's telling you how much power it requires to light up. You have 40 watt light bulbs, 60, 80, 100 watt light bulbs. A 100 watt light bulb requires 100 watts of power, 100 joules every second. And, and, and that, uh, but, but if you take that equation, P equals IV and rearrange it and solve for I, solve for current, in the bottom here, you see current is equal to power divided by voltage. Well, you can see what that means in terms of proportionality. We already know that current is proportional to power, right? If you keep voltage the same. But you also see that if you keep power constant, if we only look at I and V, current and voltage, you see those are inversely proportional. So if you have a set amount of power, and this light bulb has a set amount of power, it only works at 100 watts. If you were to change the voltage that you were, you were plugging it into, you would end up with a different current that you would measure. So, a hundred, uh, so you would have a 100 watt light bulb divided by, say, a different power. Say you had only 60 watts, and you'd end up with twice as much uh, current going through because, uh, because if you look at this formula, you see I is inversely proportional to V current is inversely proportional to voltage if power is constant. You always keep one of them constant and you look at the other two in the formula. If they're one's in the numerator and one's in the denominator on opposite sides, those are inversely proportional. So current goes up, voltage goes down, 
current goes down, voltage goes up if power is constant with this relationship. So you can look at any two of these if you keep the third one constant and, and uh, just refer back to these formulas. They're in your formula sheet. So let's talk about some of the energy saving devices that are out there. Uh, some new light bulbs that aren't nearly as energy inefficient as these classic incandescent light bulbs. These incandescent light bulbs, the one you, that the old plug in, um, you're, you're heating up a tungsten filament and most of the energy goes to heat and only a little bit goes to light. Somewhere between five and 10% becomes light. The rest of it, you're just heating up the room, right? But there are uh, new, new versions that uh, uh, can, uh, can, can work even better. Because right now, your only option, if you want a brighter bulb, you have to use a bulb that will suck up more power, more joules per second, more energy per time. And that's the only way to get a brighter bulb with incandescence. But if you use other kinds of lamps, like fluorescent lamps, these long bulbs that you put into these, these giant sockets on the tops of of uh, office buildings or whatever, you don't usually have them in your homes. Um, those, those require a, a lot less energy to produce the same amount of light. They're more efficient because they don't generate so much heat. That's why you're able to touch those with your bare hand even when they're lit up, they're not that hot. Most of the, more of the energy, not most of it, more of the energy is turned into light and less of it's turned into heat. But these are really inconvenient for homes. So somebody took one of these long bulbs, made it thinner, and essentially wrapped it up in a spiral in the same shape, rough shape, as an incandescent light bulb. So you can essentially just screw it into a light bulb socket, the old, the classic lamp socket. And so these are really just a, a giant fluorescent light bulb that's thinner and twisted up. And instead of having one end plug in one side and one end plug the other side, both ends come down into the same socket and you screw them in. And the way these work is they're filled with a mixture of a couple gases, argon gas, which is an inert gas, and mercury vapor, which is not very good for you, but there's not that much in here. And hopefully you don't break the bulbs. If you do break the bulbs, get people out of the room until the vapor has dissipated, open up the windows, especially if you have children, if you break one of these bulbs. Um, but there's mercury vapor in there and argon. What happens is the electricity comes in there, it heats up these, these atoms, and they release ultraviolet light. We can't see ultraviolet light, but the ultraviolet light hits the white coating on the inside of the bulb. That's why they're, they're painted white. That's actually a, a material that will absorb the ultraviolet and generate uh, white visible light, and that's how the, the light bulbs work. And they're, they're much more efficient. You get, I wanna say it's about 30% of the energy uh, can be used for, for producing light. Uh, so for the same power, the same wattage, they emit much more light, and as a result, you, you, need, you need to use less power, so you pay the power company less for using these, and you'll generate a lot less heat, so they'll be cooler to the touch as well than the classic incandescent bulbs. We also have light-emitting diodes, LEDs. So these are uh, little, little uh, devices that have electrodes in there for where you, where you get your voltage power through, and, and uh, these, these can be very, very small. You've probably already seen them in various appliances that, that have a light on it tell, that tells you when it's plugged in or when it's turned on. Those are generally LEDs, uh, and they're, they're, they're pretty efficient in terms of energy. Um, and, but eventually the idea is we're gonna get rid of all incandescent bulbs because they're just so energy inefficient and ultimately replace them in, in one way or another with something that's like an LED or something that's like a compact fluorescent lamp. And, and have much more efficient light production. All right, so I'm gonna pause here and we'll, we'll restart this section at electric circuits.